This region of the world used to be the global economic superpower in the past. There were dynasties that made numerous discoveries like the compass, printing, paper making, and gunpowder. They would command massive global expeditions. This was China, the Middle Kingdom, and India was right across the street. The hub of the entire world economy was located here, but things started to change around the 1800s. There was a significant revolution that began here in Europe and the United States. Science led to machines, which led to weapons, trains, vehicles, airplanes, bombs, industries, and cities. With their newfound might, these nations then began to invest in order to conquer substantial portions of the map. Although the West began to arrive and knock on China's door with its heavy weapons, China nevertheless remained a magnificent culture. China was forced to give British forces territory since they couldn't fully match their firepower. That is how Hong Kong came to be. China didn't experience the Industrial Revolution in the same way as the West, and by the middle of the 1800s, China's economic standing in the global economy had drastically declined. That situation worsened significantly when China's neighbor, Japan, attacked it a century later. China's economy was no longer that of the wealthy Middle Kingdom, but rather an impoverished replica of itself that was under foreign occupation. The West developed a new international economic and financial structure after World War II. After the war, this capitalism would prove to be a miracle for many nations, rebuilding Germany, France, and Japan. It was modeled after the economic system that was working so well in the West, capitalism, free enterprise, still with some government oversight and high taxes for the rich and corporations. Post-World War II capitalism was seen by many in the West as a magic panacea that was resolving all problems. Since it was going so well, more and more individuals began to hold the opinion that we should remove the government from capitalism and let the market to operate purely on its own. The fundamental tenet of this financial and economic system was that businesses would receive investments from individuals who held stock in those businesses or corporations, and that the main goal of these corporations was to generate profits for their owners or shareholders. According to Milton Friedman, the rule for a corporation is to grow profits. That is the social obligation of a business. According to this hypothesis, increasing short-term shareholder returns would be beneficial to everyone. And if you examine the evidence, Milton Friedman may have had a point in the West and the United States. And as a result of the US economy's explosion, the West experienced enormous wealth. What about China, I hear you ask? Were we not discussing China's economy? China, the Middle Kingdom, you know. Thus, as China was slipping deeper and deeper into decline, the US economies were prospering as a result of the corporate free market capitalism that was sweeping the globe. China resisted, adopting a communist one-party system in place of the capitalism the West was imposing on the rest of the world. Mao Zedong, who was in charge, sabotaged any attempt to have China's economy join the global economic growth. China experienced widespread poverty by the 1970s. The formerly thriving monarchy had hit rock bottom, but things were about to turn around. Deng Xiaoping is now China's new leader, and the year is the 1970s. He assumed power with the intention of reversing China's 120 years of humiliation and its demise as a superpower in other parts of the region. China's neighbors were prospering because their economies had embraced capitalism's global economic party. They witnessed enormous economic miracles and helped millions of people escape poverty. Early in his administration, Deng specially traveled to Singapore, where ethnic Chinese had embraced the free market and were prospering. He had an idea. It was time to explore if China could rebuild its economy by experimenting with some form of capitalism after the Maoist economy ideology, which had failed, was abandoned. However, he had to proceed cautiously in order to preserve China's one-party system, so he chose to concentrate his efforts on just one small village. This sleepy village in southern China had only about 30,000 residents and was located directly across the border from British-controlled Hong Kong which at the time was prospering due to its strict capitalist economy. This small town was designated by Deng Xiaoping as, quote, a special economic zone where international businesses could establish themselves and make investments in a very neoliberal free market. Hong Kong would essentially serve as a conduit between Western corporations and this tiny port in communist China. Even if it had certain aspects of Chinese capitalism, it was still socialism. 
The following event is possibly the most astounding economic miracle to have ever occurred on Earth. With only a few thousand residents and a few rice paddies, this small, peaceful village in China that was a special economic zone grew into a huge city with over 10 million inhabitants. The average salary increased from $1 per day to more than $30,000 annually. Soon, a number of Chinese towns were designated for special economic activity, basically capitalism in a socialist nation, and an increasing number of foreign businesses rushed to China for its inexpensive labor. It evolved into the global factory. As other Asian economies followed suit, China followed suit before surpassing them to overtake them as the world's second largest economy. This is depicted in a graph. Asia will overtake the rest of the world this year in accounting for more than 50% of the global GDP. It is a significant economic revolution that explains China's rise to prominence. Okay, but hold on. This is a beautiful tale about capitalism's capacity to industrialize a nation seemingly overnight and bring millions of people out of poverty. Okay, I'll just end everything up and share with you what I think it all implies. I'm sharing this tale with you because it's common knowledge that the emergence of China is a tale of how capitalism has miraculously lifted tens of millions of people out of abject poverty. But this story shows us what it has also accomplished, what this form of capitalism both encourages and produces. We must examine all of modern capitalism's impacts, not just some of them, if we're going to analyze its effects. What then is the answer? Socialism? Not at all. It's just a new form of capitalism, a different way of thinking about business and globalization that Milton Friedman would loathe, but that more and more companies are beginning to realize is necessary. The answer is to broaden capitalism rather than completely abolish it. Instead of concentrating only on shareholders and bringing them short-term profits as swiftly and effectively as possible, businesses should also pay attention to other people who are impacted by their operations you can contact these parties. This is similar to the idea of consumers, suppliers, employees, the government, the planet, the economy as a whole, and of course, shareholders. Stakeholder capitalism simply acknowledges that enterprises that prioritize shareholder profits alone do not ultimately serve the interests of all stakeholders. Winners and losers are present. It's bad for a sizable portion of the people as well as the changing climate. Oh, and this isn't some radical liberal notion either. Some of the largest American corporations, including Walmart, Apple, JP Morgan, have committed to adopting a new kind of capitalism. This is shifting, and I predict a new mode of business economy interaction over the next 5 to 10 years. You might be asking why stakeholder capitalism is our final topic after we just watched a film about China's rise. A particular form of capitalism is the tale behind China's emergence. It tells the tale of how capitalism may develop and adapt based on the roles that we want firms to play in our society. However, if you want businesses to benefit everyone, including our children and grandchildren, and their ability to live on this planet, then our capitalism needs to attract more priorities than just profits for shareholders. If we want to produce the most wealth in the most efficient way, then the old shareholder model actually really works well for that. That's it for today's video. We hope you enjoyed the content of the video. If you did, show some love and hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss out on any of the amazing videos we have in store for you.